Good evening. Thank you for joining us. I welcome you to the episode six of season two of the YF podcast series, The Professor Will See You Now. This series provides a sneak peek into the professor's personal journey, the nuances of their subject, and their approach to teaching. This masterclass will be followed by a candid conversation with a YF faculty about their YF course and ideas that drive their academic pursuit. Today's masterclass will be taken by the legendary historian and teacher, Professor Rudranshu Mukherjee. Hello, Professor. Good evening. Hi, hi, Jana. Professor teaches the YF course, Reason and the Makers of Modern India. And from personal experience, I can tell you that he's used to receiving standing ovations after the course. Professor Mukherjee is a professor of history and currently the Chancellor of Ashoka University. A renowned historian and author, he has taught history at the University of Calcutta and held visiting appointments at Princeton and the University of California. Professor was awarded a DPhil in modern history by the University of Oxford and was formerly an editor at the Telegraph. Professor is an internationally acclaimed historian of the revolt of 1857. His first book, Avadin Revolt, 1857-58, a study of popular resistance has become a standard reference on the subject. He has also authored and edited several other books on multiple themes, including Oxford India Short Introduction Jawaharlal Nehru, Twilight Falls on Liberalism, and The Penguin Gandhi Reader. His ability to bring alive history and provide nuanced insights are a few of the many things that make him such a fantastic teacher. I'm honored to have been a student at the YF. Welcome, Professor. Uh, before Professor starts his masterclass, just a few housekeeping. It'll be for around 15 minutes, after which we'll have a candid conversation. And then we'll open the floor for Q&A. You can use the box uh, saying Q&A on your right-hand side bottom to send in questions. And hopefully, we'll get all of them answered. Over to you, Professor. Thank you. Uh, the irony is that the professor will see you now, but the professor can't see you. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, anyway, but uh, these are the perils of the circumstances in which we have been placed over the last one year. So I don't know how a masterclass will work in 15 minutes, but I'll give it my best shot. Uh, the theme I have chosen is uh, Begum Hazrat Mahal, a forgotten rebel of 1857. And uh, even in my book on Awad, which Jana so kindly mentioned, uh, she doesn't make, unfortunately, she doesn't make a very detailed appearance. I have tried to make up for that uh, in a new book that should be out in July, uh, where she is one of the principal protagonists. protagonists. It's about two women leaders. The book is called a, a Begum and a Rani, Begum Hazrat Mahal and Rani Lakshmi Bai. So I am contrasting two women leaders into different parts, two different theaters of the revolt of 1857. So to come to today's, this evening's subject, 1857 made heroes out of obscure and ordinary people. As you know, most of you know that uh, the rebellion began in Meerut on the evening of the 10th of May, 1857, and a group of rebels and mutineers rode away towards Delhi, first having cut off the tel telegraph wire between that connected Delhi to Meerut. They arrived in Delhi the 11th of May, uh, in the very early in the morning. And then there was an uprising in the city of Delhi. And subsequently, once Delhi had fallen, that is, it had come under the control of the rebels and Bahadur Shah had become, accepted the nominal leadership of the rebellion. The news of the rebellion and the fall of Delhi began to travel across the Gangetic Plain 
And as it traveled, as the news reached cantonment after cantonment, those cantonments also rose in rebellion. Cantonments and the villages surrounding those cantonments rose in rebellion to defy British authority and to remove all symbols of British authority. In this manner, traveling eastwards down the Gangetic Plain, the, on the 31st of May, 30th of May rather, the news of the fall of Delhi and the news of the rising of the other cantonment towns in North India reached Lucknow, which was the capital of the kingdom of our, a very rich and a very large kingdom dating back to 1722-23. It arrived there in Lucknow and was very soon, immediately as the news arrived on the evening of the 30th of May, the garrison of Lucknow and the people of Lucknow rose in rebellion, right? And uh, this, this was an event that was waiting to happen because we have contemporary descriptions of the disquiet that was evident to any observer in Lucknow. There was anti-British slogans, pamphlets going around, the figures, caricature figures dressed as a white man was being burnt and so on and so forth. And the Lucknow garrison or garrisons actually, there was more than one garrison station in Lucknow, rose in mutiny, the people of Lucknow rose in mutiny. And just as the news of the fall of Delhi had been transmitted across the Gangetic Plain, the news of the rise of the Lucknow garrison and the people of Lucknow was transmitted into the districts of Awadh. Okay. So Parthabgarh, Faizabad, Gonda, Barej, Sitapur, Hardawi, all the major districts of Awadh, the news traveled there. And as the news reached the capital of these districts, the garrisons in these districts and the villagers in these districts also took to arms to defy British authority. Once having done that, and this is the point of all this, they marched to Lucknow. So Lucknow virtually becomes a rebel city with the British population, or to put it, put it more precisely, the European population, the entire white population, because there were non-British people living in Lucknow, non-British white people living in Lucknow as well. They took refuge and protection in the Lucknow residency, which was where the resident of Awadh resided. It was a very large area. It's still there. When you travel to Lucknow, you can see it. It's a lot. Now, of course, it's in ruins and in a, in a place where tourists visit and pe the people of Lucknow till very recently used to go for their morning walks. Okay, but the buildings in a broken down state because it took a hell of a lot of shelling are still there. So they took refuge in the residency and they were surrounded on all sides by the rebels. But the British did not take this lying down. They decided to resist. And there was a confrontation between the British army that was stationed in Lucknow and this rebel army that had gathered in Lucknow on the last day of June in 1857. The British were decisively defeated. This was the Battle of Chinhat. C-H-I-N-H-A-T, decisively defeated. And they retreat, retreated into the residency. Once this defeat had occurred, word spread in Lucknow and then radiating into the district that British rule was over. Firangi rule khatam. And the rule of the Nawab, the rule of the King of Awadh was back. And as if to mark this to mark this happening, the rebels put on the throne a 12-year-old son of the former king, Wajid Ali Shah. The 12-year-old son was called Birjis Qadar. They made him, declared him, put him on the throne on the takht 
and declared him to be the king of our and and in in an in a remarkable gesture of communal solidarity of religious solidarity hindu sepoys muslim hindu sepoys gathered around birji's kadar a muslim prince and hailed him as you are our kanhaiya you are our krishna okay now it is with this coronation that begum hazrat mahal enters the annals of the 1857 uprising if this hadn't happened nobody would have known about begum hazrat mahal she wouldn't have been a footnote in history so why she wouldn't have been a footnote in even a footnote in history we need to now look at who begum hazrat mahal was okay so first the evidence on her early life is extraordinarily scanty hardly anything is known about her the stray bits of evidence scraps of evidence really that is available i've tried to stitch it together so what one has come to know is the following she was the daughter of an african slave of wajid ali shah and wajid ali shah's father so she is a slave's daughter but she was remarkably beautiful and of course she had and perhaps she also had musical and artistic talent because her father put her entered her into the music school that wajid ali shah had set up wajid ali shah was a great patron of music and culture he had set up a music school the, the music school had a great name it was called the pari khana the house of fairies or house of angels and all members of the school were given a name to which pari was attached so hazrat mahal became mahak pari right and this is where she learned to dance to took music lessons and because of her talents and her good looks she caught the fancy of the king wajid ali shah who took her as one of his wives one of his muta wives m u t a muta wives okay now there's a great sequence in satyajit ray's satranj ke khiladi because where the british resident james utram asks his secretary who is very fluent in persian and urdu and so on and so forth he says what does this mean muta wife so this man western he says muta wives means wives for pleasure okay so mahpari becomes a muta wife of wajid ali shah but because of the pleasure they indulged in or engaged in a son was born in 1845 this is birji's kadar once a son was born mahak pari was made in given the title of a mahal okay this is was a custom or a tradition that wajid ali shah had created women that he particularly wanted to honor were given the title of mahal so mahak hazrat mahal bega of mahak pari we don't know her original name what her father called her we know her as mahak pari mahak pari gets the very grandiose title of now i must read this out because it's a very big title nawab iftikar un nisa begum hazrat mahal sahiba okay so she becomes mark pari becomes nawab iftikar un nisa begum hazrat mahal sahiba okay very elevated and i said a very grandiose title but within 5 years time fortune stops smiling at hazrat mahal sahiba and she is given a talaq she is divorced by wajid ali shah not just she but six other five other muta wives are also given the talaq and 
the stories in Lucknow at that time was that Wajid Ali Shah had been forced to give them talak because they were of lower origin and Wajid Ali Shah's mother did not want women of such low origins to be part of Wajid Ali Shah's household or harem. So but in 1840, 1850, Hazrat Mahal is dismissed from the harem and she loses the title of Begum. Okay. But as fate would have it, in six years time, Wajid Ali Shah is removed as the king of Awadh by the British who annex Awadh in early February, 5th of February, I think it is, in 1856, and then send away Wajid Ali Shah and his family to Calcutta on exile. Now, because Hazrat Mahal was no longer even a muta wife of Wajid Ali Shah, she is not part of the entourage that goes with Wajid Ali Shah or to Calcutta. So she is, remains in Lucknow and it so happens that her son is made the king. Birchis Kadar is made the king. But Birchis Kadar is only 12 years old. So he, of course, is incapable of taking major decisions, especially decisions pertaining to the conduct of a war, which is what now the rebels of Lucknow and in the districts of our, that what they are engaged in. So the power behind the throne is his mother who now reclaims her title of Begum and comes to be known as Begum Hazrat Mahal. Okay, so she was Mahakpari, became Begum Hazrat Mahal, lost Begum, the title of Begum Hazrat Mahal, reclaimed the title of Begum Hazrat Mahal. Fortune is playing around with her. Okay, she's a plaything of fortune, it would appear. But from the time that her son becomes the king and she is the power behind the throne. Hazrat Mahal becomes a key figure and a key decision maker in how the rebellion was to be conducted. So the first thing she does is she sets up an administrative machinery. Okay. So the administrative machinery has two parts to it. One is a council of war, how the war is to be fought and organized, the military structure, the military strategy, the military plan. And the other is the, what for the lack of a better term might be called civil administration. So what does that entail? To fight a war, you need money. Where is the money going to come from? How is the revenue going to be collected? What is going to be the rate of the revenue? How are supply chains to be maintained? Okay, supply chains of ammunition, supply chains of food. So the links between the countryside and Lucknow, these have to be re-established so that the war can continue. Hazrat Mahal is she sets up a group of people, both to look after the war aspect, the council of war. She appoints soldiers, generals who had been with Wajid Ali Shah's army, officers who had been with Wajid Ali Shah's army to look to man the council of war. And she gets former ministers, former administrators of the Aud administration to look after the civil side. But she is the coordinator, as it were, between these two branches of the war effort. She is, all decisions have to have her endorsement and her agreement. It has to, technically it has to have the endorsement of the king, Virjis Kadar, but Virjis Kadar won't give an endorsement until, unless his mother says this is okay. So this is how the rebellion in Awad, based in Lucknow, comes to be organized. And Hazrat Mahal, as I said, is the key figure. So between 18 July 1857 to around November 1857, 
Lucknow is in the is the center of the battle. The British are trying to regain Lucknow. The rebels are trying to defend Lucknow and trying to ensure that Lucknow once again doesn't go back into the control of the British. The rebels fail. It is evident in November that they are being defeated despite a spirited defense of Lucknow. And what the rebels do, so in the first phase of the rebellion, as I just said, the countryside came into Lucknow. Okay. Now, the people of Lucknow go into the countryside okay, to carry on a guerrilla warfare that lasted till around March, April 1858. Hazrat Mal with Birchis Kadar and her loyal officers also goes out of Lucknow and she travels to the northern districts of Awadh, Gonda and Barej, where she sets up her headquarters, her camp headquarters. And from there, she conducts the war again. And we have detailed accounts of these plans and strategies that she's putting into place. But increasingly, it's becoming a desperate battle, very desperate battle. And she knows she's on the losing side and she's being pushed further and further northwards towards Nepal, where she finally escapes with a handful of very loyal followers, five, 500, 600 of them, and Birjis Kadar, of course, her son. She escapes into Nepal, and this is where she dies in penury and in obscurity. We don't know the circumstances of her death. So there seems to be a kind of the way her life began and the way her life ended, began in obscurity, ended in obscurity. There, is some, there seems, seems to be a kind of a rhyme to it, as it were, you know. So that's what happens to her. And that her escape to Nepal is a swan song of the rebellion in our. But there is one thing she did before she escaped, and I will end with that. In March 1858, February, March 1858, Queen Victoria issued a proclamation. This is known, famously known as the Queen's Proclamation. Of course, she didn't write it herself. Her prime minister and other ministers, officials wrote it for her. She gave her signature imprimatur to it. She gave her signature to it. And it does come to be known as the Queen's Proclamation. The Queen's Proclamation says many things. The most important of it is that India will henceforth be ruled directly by the Crown, not by the English East India Company. That's one. And the second thing she says is that we will not interfere in the social and religious customs and practices of the Indian people. Okay, this is their own business. They are free to worship the way they want to do, free to carry out their social rituals and so on and so forth. Now, and it has many other points. Before she escapes, as this Queen's proclamation came to be known and came to be circulated, Hazrat Mahal actually issued a point by point point rebuttal of the Queen's proclamation. So she was not just conducting a war with arms. She was also conducting a war of words. Every single point that the Queen's proclamation made, and I don't have the time in 15 minutes, I'm already well past 15 minutes to go into the details of the rebuttal. But one point I need to emphasize, she said, Maharani Victoria is saying that she will not interfere in our religion, in our social customs. Why should we believe her? Look at the track record of the Firangi. Ever since they arrived in India, they have violated and transgressed every single treaty, every single agreement and arrangement that, we, that they entered with the Indian rulers. 
And the best example she gives is, of course, of her husband, Wajid Ali Shah. Look what they did to Wajid Ali Shah. So the Firangi cannot be trusted. So don't trust the Firangi. Carry on fighting the Firangi. I am also trying, carrying on fighting the Firangi. We should do everything we can to throw the Firangi out of Hindustan. So this is her last message, if you like, that we must continue the fight. Unfortunately, she cannot continue the fight. So, and she is forced to escape into Nepal. And as I said, she dies there in penury and obscurity. But very few historians, unfortunately, even I am guilty of it. Uh, when I first wrote the book on our, of reconstructing her life, I have tried to make amends. So those of you who have greater interest in Begum Hazrat Mal, uh, look forward to that book in July and read it. So I'm sorry, I'm not trying to puff my own book, but it will be the only account of Hazrat Mal that is has, has been written till now. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor. I was actually just going to say I mean, if this is even 10% of what's going to be in the book, it's going to make a very interesting and informative read. So just to continue, if you could tell us two more things in the proclamation that you found uh, revealed her character as an individual before she uh, went into obscurity. One thing should be obvious, just as the Queen's proclamation wasn't written by the Queen, mm. Hazrat Mahal's proclamation was not also written by Hazrat Mahal. Mm. Okay. There is no evidence that Hazrat Mahal could write. She could probably read, mm. but there's no evidence that she could write and write so eloquently and so logically, even if she could write, there's no evidence. So obviously, there was a group of advisors and writers who constructed this counter proclamation. Okay. The most significant part is the way they drew upon history in great detail to rebut the claims of Queen Victoria. They actually go back to the reign of Sirajatola mm -hmm. in Bengal, 1757, 100 years ago. This is what you did to Sirajatola. This is what you did to Tipu Sultan. This is what you did to the Marathas. This is what you did to Bahadur Shah. This is what you did to Wajid Ali Shah. So, you know, in chronological sequence, they did. so their knowledge of history is very deep and they also know how to use this history for purposes of polemic. I think this is very significant because most of the time in most, even scholarly writing on 1857, the rebellion is seen as not having a mind or a consciousness. Mm. This proclamation alone, there are, there are many other evidence, pieces of evidence that I can Sight to show that the rebellion has a, had a mind or minds. But this proclamation alone shows that there was a thing, there was persons thinking about what they were fighting for and what this rebellion was about. I think this is the most significant part of that proclamation. And Professor, do you see something? Um, something similar when contrasting her life with Rani Lakshmi Bai? Contrast is the word. Okay, mm. There are many points of contrast. For example, the most important contrast is there is no account and therefore no evidence that Begum Hazrat Mahal actually took part in battle. Mm. She was the typical general at the back of her troops conducting affairs. She did not go into the gun smoke of warfare. Okay. Whereas Lakshmi Bai is exactly the opposite. She was visible in battle on horseback, fighting with an open sword with the troops. Okay. So she was a very visible figure. And 
British generals who were trying to defeat her wrote about her bravery. Whereas Hazrat Mahal in that sense is a figure that is not visible. She, he is, she is invisible, rendered invisible. Uh, one writer much later, much later, writing in the beginning of the 20th century, in fact, suggests that Hadrat Mahal never came out of Parda. Now, I find that very difficult to believe. You cannot traverse the whole of Awad from Lucknow to Nepal on Parda, mm. under Parda, or attend court under Parda. It's very difficult, possible, but it's very difficult to do it, especially if you are pushed into a crisis, which, which she was, especially after November 1857. So she may not have been under Parda, but she certainly did not fight with gun and sword in the way that Lakshmi Bai did. This is the first very striking contrast. The second striking contrast is that Begum Hazrat Mahal was a rebel from the day Lucknow shook off British authority. From May 1857, she's a rebel. Lakshmi Bai takes her time. She has reasons to take her time. She joins the rebellion only in December 1857. So there is a time lag. So one is an immediate joiner and the other is, is somewhat weighed her pros and cons. And when she found that all her options had been closed, she was trying to strategize, in other words. And when she found that all her actions were, options were closed, she jumped into the, literally jumped into the rebellion because she, won, she was on horseback and jumped out of the fort. Okay. So those are the two striking pieces of contrast. And the third striking pieces of contrast is that because Lakshmi Bai was a woman of action, she mm. did not engage in a war of words. She was only engaged in actual warfare, actual physical warfare, and she died in the battlefield. Mm. Whereas Hazrat Mahal escaped and lived in poverty, might be, but did not actually embrace a martyr's death. Thank you, Professor. We've got a very interesting question from an anonymous attendee, and they're asking. When characters like Begum Hazrat Mahal start in obscurity as well as get ignored in the later in their life, how do you research such characters? How do you build your narrative around it? Uh, so, you know, the revolt of 1857, I'm answering this question specifically in the specific context of the revolt of 1857. Some generalizations can be made about from that, but my answer is to the specific context of the revolt of 1857. So the revolt of 1857 was defeated. It was okay. suppressed and defeated. Okay. So, and most of the rebels, large percentage, I would say 90 to 95% of the rebels, because they were just simple common people, they were illiterate. Mm -hmm. So they did not leave behind any records, written evidence. And also because they were on the losing side, even the some of them who knew how to read and write, if they had left behind any written testimony, those came to be, they, they were lost or they came to be burned. They themselves might have burnt them, whatever. There is no, no, rebel testimony, if you like, except this is a major exception. We have about 20, 25 ishtahars or proclamations that were issued by rebel leaders. One proclamation I've already mentioned, the Begum mm -hmm. Hazrat Mahal proclamation, probably the second most important proclamation to come out of the rebel side. So there was another proclamation issued by Emperor Bahadur Shah, which is called the Azamgarh Proclamation, which is very early in the rebellion, 25th of August, 1857. It was issued in Azamgarh in the name of Bahadur Shah. It's, this is the earliest proclamation that we have. 
And there are other minor proclamations. Two major proclamations are mentioned, but there were other minor proclamations as well. So these proclamations, the important point is these proclamations are actually voices of the leadership. Mm. These are leaders speaking or writing to persuade and to propagandize. Okay, you should join this war and these are the reasons why you should join this war. Okay, and they are making it irrespective of caste, class, religion. All Indians, it is your moral responsibility to fight the Firangi. Okay. So the proclamations say this. Other than these 2025 proclamations, we have nothing that emanated from the rebel side. So what do we have now? We now have a victor's archive. Okay. Now, because they were suppressing a major insurgency, the British actually kept detailed accounts of how they suppressed this insurgency in various parts of North India. We have detailed accounts of these. Very detailed. I cannot tell you how detailed. Okay. They needed to write this in detail actually to self justify themselves. We needed to send out 1,000 troops because we were confronted by 7,000 troops. So, mm -hmm. you know, so the threat was so big, we had to fight it. So mm -hmm. they recorded things. Now, this body of evidence, if you read it not as a narrative of triumph that the British wanted it to be, yes. if you read that archive as the saying goes, against the grain, what can we find out from these archives about what the rebels were doing? Yeah. Therefore, from that, we can reconstruct the lives of at least some persons involved in the rebellion, like Lakshmi Bai, much in much greater detail than Begum Hazrat Mahal. But even Begum Hazrat Mahal's strategies, plans, where she was hiding, how she was making the people of our fight, all these are actually recorded by the British as an act of carrying out their counterinsurgency operations. And one has to re read those victors' archives in this manner, as I said, against the grain and retrieve this information and then put it into your own framework. My framework is not to write about British heroism. Mm -hmm. My framework is to try and understand what the rebels were trying to do. And therefore that information becomes absolutely crucial. Those facts become absolutely crucial. It's, it's a method of reading, methods of reading conventional archives a different method to read the conventional archive. So, Professor, when did you come up with this method? Like, I mean, during your student days, or was it when you were doing your DPhil? Like, could you tell us a bit about that? So, when I decided to write, start my research after I had finished my master's degree, and I decided that I would go on to do or uh, doctorate, I chose to write, chose 1857 my, as my subject and chose Awadh, the rebellion in Awadh to be my principal focus. And uh, I jumped into the archives actually. I had read most of the secondary stuff as a student, so I straight went into the archives. And then I found that these archives were all written by British officers. Memorandum, narrative of events, reports that were being sent from the field to the headquarters and so on and so forth. And then it struck me, the puzzle that I posed, you know, what am I going to do? I, I'm not interested in what the British were doing. And then I started reading these same things in greater detail with different questions in mind. Mm -hmm. 
can they tell me something about what the rebels were doing and as i read in greater detail it became obvious to me that yes i could get information about what the rebels were doing by looking at the same material but asking different questions of that material that's that it was hard work mm. it was first very disillusioning mm. because my first thing was to throw my hands up and says oh my god there goes my uh, doctoral dissertation i don't want to write about the british i want to write about indian rebels and how am i going to do it but then as i went into the archives and more and more in depth into the archives i realized that it was possible to do it and that's how i that's how what i did and i mean it, it takes a lot of insight at that age to be able to do that did you i mean was your dfil supervisor tutor i mean could you tell us a bit about the conversations that you had with them when you were deciding on this topic in your journey so the topic was decided even before i had gone to oxford so okay. my my supervisor was served by with a fait accompli when i met him for the first time in oxford in october 1977 i told him this is what i plan to do and i have already started the research i have already gone to the archives and looked at some of the stuff okay so in that sense the supervisor supervisor did not have very much say on the matter and we actually <laughs> didn't have any conversation on this matter but there were two other persons who were not officially my supervisors but one was a very major influence on the way i approached the study of history and then more specifically the way i approached the problems of 1857 he was a historian called borunde in in calcutta uh borunde was a man of prodigious memory and prodigious learning and reading and uh, and he actually encouraged me he mm-hmm. said just go on go to the archives and keep reading i'm sure you will find stuff i mean it is not possible uh so you know he kept my morale going and while i was already in the archives researching i had the good fortune again thanks to borunde of meeting a historian based in the university of cambridge i actually met him in patna of all mm-hmm. places uh in a seminar his name was eric stokes mm-hmm. he he was one of the persons who had pioneered a different approach to look at the problem of 1857 and he was also concerned with the same issue what do we know about the rebels who were the rebels why did the rebel so on so forth but he was not looking at our he was looking at western uttar pradesh and i had many conversations with eric and uh, he finally also examined my detailed thesis in oxford but and eric also like borunde he said keep at it there is stuff out there let me tell you if i am getting stuff for western up you will also get stuff for our so don't get disheartened okay so i think the encouragement and the confidence of these two historians added uh, gave me a lot of impetus to carry on with the work and not to feel too dis- dis- disheartened that i was only looking at the victors archives so in the interstices of the victors archives there were rebel voices hidden which one had to retrieve and professor i mean you taught every batch at the yf and everybody i've met has come up to me and said that it's been a brilliant course across all these years um based on your experience as a teacher as well as a student which you just mentioned about what what were you hoping that the course would bring to a yf student's journey so when pramod sena brought me in 2011 to teach in yf uh, he didn't tell me that 
behind the YF was the dream of Ashoka University. He yeah. just said, we are starting this liberal arts program and uh, will you come and teach? So I said, yeah, I love to teach. Uh, I love teaching. And he said, we need a history course. There has to be a history component to why I have. Okay, there will be many other liberal arts subjects being taught, but there is no history courses yet. So you have to construct a history course and then deliver it to the students. So I thought that these were students who were whatever profile I was giving in, uh, well, I was given for the first batch, there were 58 of them, I think. And most of them had never studied history beyond high school. Okay. So after class eight or nine, history has disappeared from their scope of learning. And so I thought it would be best to, and these were all bright kids who were grounded on the Indian reality, the present Indian reality, the present meaning 2011 reality. They, they knew what the reality was. Now, I thought I should construct a course which would enable them to connect their present to the past. Okay, that the present does not make sense unless you can relate it to the past. So, how was this present made? And that is what led me to construct the course called Reason and the Making of Modern India, which unfortunately goes by the shorthand Makers of Modern India. The course is not called Makers of Modern India. It's called Reason and the Making of Modern India. And to make it more attractive to the students, because they were all, all of them had the idea that history was boring, History was one damn fact after another. History was a feat of memory. It, history had to be learned by rote. So I wanted to break that too. So to make it more attractive, uh, to capture their attention, as it were, I thought I would do it through individuals. Hmm. How from one individual to another, this journey of reason in a zigzag manner, not through a straight line, continued and continues to continue. I wanted to convey to them that you as reasonable young adults are actually taking forward this journey that had begun with Ramon Roy's quest for reason. And Professor, out of, out of your teaching, Whose idea of reason or whose life do you resonate as the value level with out of the leaders that you teach in this course? Difficult to say. Different values from different people. I mean, you know, uh, I don't think uh, to your batch, I taught this individual, Kamala Devi Chattopadhyay. Uh, Bhashwar might have been taught that by me. I, it, she was a late entry into the course, I think into the, after the fourth or the fourth year, I introduced mm -hmm. Kamala Devi Chattopadhyay among the leaders I was teaching. A lot of Kamala Devi Chattopadhyay resonates with me. A lot of Jawaharlal Nehru res resonates with me. And certainly Gandhi does. And Ishwar Chandra Vidyasa, who is in many ways uh, a hero of mine. Uh, I'm not prone to hero worship, but if there's one person who I would be prone to call a hero of mine, it would be Ishwar Chandra Vidyasaga. So, you know, so all these people at different levels uh, resonate, uh, their values, what they stood for, what they tried to do in their lives. Uh, so I tried to, I, I tried to capture and I enjoy trying to capture. So if, if you like the word resonate, yes, some of these people, there. but I, it would be difficult for me to, pick out one individual. Uh, the other question that uh, I'm often asked is because I teach Gandhi with so much passion and there's a lot of Gandhi that I admire. I, and I admire his Ahimsa, I admire his Abhay, I admire his commitment with truth. 
a lot of people ask me outside the class and inside the class, am I a Gandhian? I'm not a Gandhian. Do I look like a Gandhian? <laughs> so, you know, but you, one doesn't have to be a Gandhian to admire Gandhi. These are universal values. Nonviolence, fearlessness, these are in universal values. And one does not have to be in agreement with every aspect of Gandhi's thoughts. And it's impossible to agree with all that Gandhi said. He was a maverick individual. He had idiosyncratic views about many things, particularly say about medicine. <laughs> okay, so, but in spite of that, there are some aspects that one can still aspire to. And the most important thing about Gandhi is that he stood by his values. He mm. did compromise. I think that's a very important value to cherish. And also for us as students to learn from the course. Yeah. To take that approach as well. And in the, in the same vein, how is it that you decided to do a book on two contrasting female characters, the Begum and the Rani? Uh, I don't know whether they are contrasting, but they are part of the same tumultuous event that engulfed North India in 1857. And as I said, I was also trying to make amends. Uh, mm. you know, I had never written about Lakshmi Bai because I had not written about the rebellion in Chasi. And I was also, I always felt that I had not dealt with Hazrat Mahal adequately in that book on our. There was one other reason that drove me, and it has nothing to do with individuals. History is an act of remembering. Hmm. History is also an act of forgetting. We remember certain things, we forget certain things. Either deliberately or unwittingly, we forget certain things. Because there's selectivity involved in any construction of history. And Lakshmi Bai is remembered. Hazrat Mahal is not remembered. So I wanted to contrast remembrance with forgetfulness. That's the bigger theme in the book. I don't know how to even follow that with a question because it's put me in a deep thought. Um, uh, I'd like to pick something from the audience. And yes. um, when you were starting out as a student of history and then later writing history itself, um, this person is particularly asking that a lot of people say that the writing of history is more skewed towards the male perspective or the victor's perspective. Um, do you think that is changing now or it has already changed, it was just not in popular culture? It had begun to change by the 1970s and it has of course drastically changed now. I mean, uh, 1974, I think, yeah, I was a first year master student uh, when this book came out by Sheila Robotham. I don't know if people still read it. We read it avidly. It was called Women's Consciousness, Men's World. Mm. Penguin published it. And, you know, so how women became conscious of themselves as women in a world that was dominated by men. Robotham wrote about that. And, you know, I think that was a very formative book uh, in a formative phase of many of our lives. And we became conscious of this. And also, uh, many of us who uh, grew up in the 1970s, we are students in the 1970s, we had the dream of a better world in our eyes, you know, a fairer world, an equal world, a more radical world. And therefore, we were drawn to the underdog, those who had been defeated. So many people of our generation actually wrote about the defeated. I was just one of a collective. 
and professor how do you think history should be taught to the coming generation jana the first thing i want to point out is there's no should be in this okay it is no moral imperative in it hmm so the only thing i would say that history should be taught in an interesting way and please whoever is going on to teach history from the listeners or from the yif please tell don't tell students that history is a mug subject history is not a feat of memory history is about understanding it's about comprehension it's about interpretation it's about joining dots how do i join my present with dots to the past and professor why don't you see it as a moral imperative to make that connection it is not a moral it. imperative i am saying there is no should this is the way history should be taught okay i'm not say i'm saying it is not that there's no one method of teaching history i teach it in one way you ask some you ask nanjot lahiri how she teaches it she to be different mm. that's what makes the subject so exciting that there are different subjective ways of looking at the past history i little bit of an exaggeration and provocation here history is not objective history is subjective <laughs> how i reconstruct the past may not be the same as how another person reconstructs the past and is is in that way, i will reconstruct my past my own past may not mm-hmm. be the way if you became my biographer or somebody else became my biographer may not be the same way that i that she will reconstruct my own past okay jawalal nehru left behind an autobiography but when we reconstruct jawalal nehru's life do we follow the same principles on which the autobiography is constructed we don't mm. that was his subjective view of his own past his biographers have their their own subjective views of nehru's life and within that subjectivity as a discipline do you think that they should be standardized frameworks or everybody should every historian should develop their own frameworks of approaching sources on a time period absolutely they should de- they should develop their own frameworks with the one very important caveat mm-hmm. history is not fiction history is based on facts so whatever framework you are making whatever interpretation you are giving or as the phrase goes these days whatever spinning you are spin mm-hmm. you are providing it must have a factual basis that's the anchor that's the mooring of the subject it is not hanging in the air somewhere okay if i say lakshmi bai was a fighter i must be able to demonstrate through facts this is how she fought this is where she fought this is how she died mm. these cannot be constructs of the imagination in the same vein we have a question from aditya arun and he is asking you professor as a chancellor to a university how do you see the future of learning history both in schools and in colleges oh uh, with mathematics history is the worst taught subject in schools mm-hmm. it's worst taught because some of the best students do not go on to become historians and then then do not go on to become school teachers school teachers school teaching is considered to be a lowly profession okay in the hierarchy of professions i know that from first hand experience because my wife is a school teacher she has never thought of being anything else she could have been a many a lot of other things but from the day she left college 
she decided she would be a teacher of history in a school. And I know from her own experience, you know, how teachers of history are actually treated, mm. say, compared to a teacher of physics or something like that. You know? And generally how school teachers are treated. So unless that changes, unless society changes its attitude to school teachers, and the first way that they can change their attitude to school teachers is by paying them more, by valuing them more. Mm -hmm. okay? So even as when I was vice chancellor and I now as chancellor, I give, I get distraught, distraught parents coming to see me and say, what have you done to my daughter? She wants to be a teacher. She doesn't want to be a computer scientist, which <laughs> is why we sent her to Ashoka. My son doesn't want to be an economist and join the World Bank, which we thought he should, he would be doing. Now he says he's going to teach. You know, as if that boy or that girl is doing something terrible, it's the end of the world. But these are, I don't blame those parents. This is the societal ambiance. This is the value that we have put on teaching. And this hasn't changed. This hasn't changed over the last 50 years. It was exactly this when I took to the profession of teaching. I remember my relatives looking at me with scorn. And the more kind, kindly among them would raise their eyebrows and he would say, will you be able to earn a living by teaching? It hasn't changed. Unless society changes these attitudes, it's not just a task of one university, one chancellor. It's a societal responsibility about how you look upon teachers. And to conclude, Professor, in spite of the opposition of the time and societal expectations, why did you become a teacher? What was it that drew you to it? What made me become a teacher is I wanted to continue to learn. Teaching for me is only in part a way to earn a livelihood. The real riches of teaching, if you can see on the camera what is behind me, those are the real riches of teaching. To learn continuously by reading, by interacting with scholars, by interacting with students, by writing, that's why I became a teacher. And luckily for us, the riches are far beyond this podcast. So uh, thank you so much, Professor, for making the time and sharing parts of your life with us in the audience. Um, just to remind everybody, any of your friends who've missed it, please go see the YF YouTube channel and rewatch it. And Professor, any last concluding words for the people who are here listening to you? The Katha Upanishad says, Khrusha Dhara Nishita Durataya Durgam Padasthat Kavayo Badanti. The poets have said that the path to knowledge is like walking on a razor's edge in darkness. Never forget that. This is not an easy thing, this journey to knowledge is not an easy, it's an arduous task. And we have to constantly be at it. That's why I wanted to call this talk a journey without an end. Thank you, Professor. Look forward to reading your book in July. Thank you. Thank you. God bless everybody.
Thank you, Jana.